Okay, so I'm continuing our series on the family. Uh, we took a little break there, um, just because I wasn't feeling 100%, and, and Jason filled in for me last week, so I appreciate that. In fact, I appreciate Brother Jason very much for making the journey down to Sydney. Um, honestly, you know, having a satellite church in Sydney is a big deal. I mean, it's a long way to travel, you know, it's expensive, there's cost and all, there's all that involved, there's time. And uh, if I didn't have your help, if, if I didn't have your support, if I didn't have your prayers, it wouldn't be possible. You know, that's the truth, that's the truth. So I really appreciate this church, as small as we are, you know, a few of us aren't here tonight, but as small as we are, you know, the Lord is using us to reach a number of people. Uh, this church is a blessing even to people all the way to Sydney, so that's a great thing. But let's, let's, go on, let, let's uh, look at Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians uh, chapter 5 verse 25, Ephesians 5 25, just that first bit there, husbands, love your wives. The title of the sermon tonight is Love Your Wife. Okay, love your wife. And this is a sermon for husbands. Okay, so um, if you're not a husband, but you're a wife, then listen up anyway, because, hey, it's good for all of us. It's good to, if you have children, if you have boys, to raise your boys to know what it is to be a biblical husband. It's good to raise your boys to know what it means to love your, their wives when they grow up, so they can honor and respect and follow the commands that we have in the Bible. Okay. Now, the first thing you might be thinking if you're a husband, that includes me as well, is of course I love my wife. Of course I love her. I married her. You know, uh, we've been together for X amount of years. You know, we've probably had kids together, all those kind of things. The first thought is, of course I love her. That's not the question. Do you love her? The question is, are you loving her the way you ought to love her? Are you loving her the way the Bible teaches us how we ought to love her? And it's a, it's a very high standard. Very high standard. I've heard women say, it's not fair. You know, the wives are to submit to their husbands and the husbands just have to love them. Yeah, but have you seen in what way they're meant to love their wives? The way Christ loved the church. Wow. The way Jesus Christ gave himself, sacrificed himself on the cross for the church. That same measure of love is how we ought to love our wives. It's a big requirement. It's a big commandment, okay? It's not just lovey-dovey feelings, but the love of God in the Bible is more than just lovey-dovey feelings. You know, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Love in the Bible always follows with the, the works, with doing the works for him, okay? And when we talk about loving the wife, it's not the lovey-dovey feelings only, but it's serving her, loving her making sure she's a priority in our life, lifting her up and honouring her as the wife of, 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 um, that belongs to us. You know? Now, one of the stupid comments that I've heard in church, by people, by husbands, is, well, I would love my wife. I would love her more if she was more submissive toward me. Because the Bible says there in verse 22, look at Ephesians 5, 22, it first says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. And then you get to verse 25. Husband, love your wives. And the stupid argument I've heard by more than one person is, well, if my wife was just more submissive, I could love her more. There's a reason why they say God put the wives first to submit and then the husbands to love. As though it's some sort of condition, right? I can only love her if she's first submissive to me. But is that the love of Christ? Did Christ come lovingly sacrificing himself because we were first submissive to him? No, what does the Bible say? You know, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Hey, we were sinners first. We weren't submissive to the Lord. We weren't trying to follow his commands. You know, but still God loved us so much to send his son to die for us. Hey, the love bit comes first when it comes to this relationship between Christ and the church, and that's the comparison. Now, the other mistake that I see made quite often with this passage is because it, it um, uses the analogy of a husband and wife it's, and, and, as Christ and the church. I mean, how many of you guys have heard the church is the bride of, of the Lamb or the bride of Christ? You know, the church is the bride. And they take it. Where do they take it from? You know where? It's right here. Ephesians chapter 5. Even though Ephesians 5 does not even mention the word bride once. Okay? Now, you say, well, hold on, Kevin. It's talking about a husband and wife, surely. Well, then why aren't they saying the church is the wife 
of Jesus Christ. You <laughs> see, but they just make things up because they've got something to go by. Now, the Bible tells us who the bride of the Lamb is in the book of Revelation. We won't go there. It's New Jerusalem. You can read it for yourself. Very clear. It's New Jerusalem, heavenly Jerusalem that descends from heaven onto the earth um, during the, the new heavens and the new earth. And of course, we are going to be part of that. You know, the New Testament churches, you know, are going to be part of that New Jerusalem. So in a way, yes, you know. But you've got to understand, this is an analogy. You know, God is teaching us about how Christ loves the church by using the analogy of husband and wife, okay? It's an analogy. It's to tell us a story, okay? It's to allow us to compare things and understand how much Jesus loves the church. And then for us as husbands, all right, to go, hey, we need to love our wives the way Jesus Christ loved the church, okay? Now, I'll just quickly read to you 1 John 5, uh, sorry, 1 John 4, 19. You don't need to turn there. And we read this in the men's morning um, yesterday, uh, our Bible study. Um, if uh, We love him because he first loved us. We love Jesus Christ. We love our Lord God because he first loved us. And if you remember what we taught about the, the institutions that we're going through, talking about the institution of the family, who's the leader of the family? Who's the head of the family? It's the husband. It's the father. Okay? If, if you're the leader, that means you lead. You take the first steps and you have others follow you. So husbands, what I'm trying to say to you is whether you're or not your wife is submissive to you, you need to love her regardless. All right? I mean, even you as saved people, you know you still disobey God. You, you know you're still not 100% submissive to our Lord God because you still commit sin. You still fail. Does that mean God doesn't love us? Oh, they, they, had, they didn't submit this time, so I'm not going to stop loving them. No, of course not. Okay? But the command is first. It's coming from the husband. You're the head. You've got to lead. You know, if you want a submissive wife, you've got to love her. <laughs> All right? That's going to be, that's step number one. You want her to be submissive, you've got to show her love. Now, let me just say this. If your wife is not submissive, okay, it's, it's one of two things. Like I just said, well, first of all, let me just say, she just might be a stubborn woman. That's a possibility, okay? We're going to be talking about wives next week, okay? She might just be a very stubborn woman. It's something she needs to work on, something she needs to get right with the Lord. You know, maybe she's backslidden from the Lord, and that's preventing him from being submissive to her husband, okay? Because it is possible for you to just be loving her, you know, doing everything you can, and she's still uh, stubborn. It's possible, okay? And that means she's not right with the Lord, okay? But more often than not, you know, wives want to be submissive. <laughs> More often than not, they want to be submissive. And it's just the reason why they're not submissive is just poor leadership. Being a poor husband, a lack of love. Your wife is not feeling it. Now, you might say, of course I love my wife. But she might not be feeling it. Okay, she might not be seeing it. She might not be receiving it. There might be something there that you need to work on. And again, I'm focusing on the men today, and I'm always going to take a harder position on the husbands and the wife. Always, because you're the leader. You're the head, right? I mean, if someone in the church messes up, you know, that's bad. But if a pastor messes up, how much worse? Right? When you're the head, when you're the leader, you've got to set the example. You know, you've got to have a higher standard. You've got to strive, you know, uh, for the high calling of Jesus Christ. You know, and if people are always complaining about their wife, it just shows me you're a weak husband. It just shows me you're a weak leader, okay? And more often than not, you're just lacking the love toward your wife, okay? So let's get, let's get through this. Let's have a look at this. We're going to be, spent, uh, be spending most of our time here in Ephesians chapter 5. Actually, yeah, pretty much all our time. Ephesians 5, 25. Let's look at it again. I've got, uh, I think it's five points. Let me have a look at that again. Yep, I've got five points of how to love your wife, how to biblically love your wife. Point number one is to love her with a sacrificial love. Sacrificial love, meaning you're willing to give even yourself, your own life. You're willing to die for your wife. Point number one, look at Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church how did he love the church and gave himself for it? Gave himself for it. Jesus Christ was willing to die for his church, to shed his blood, 
to go for a, 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 a gruesome death, not just an average death, but one that brings shame okay, and reproach. He took on the sins of the whole world. He died for, for, for the church. And as husbands, and look, I think if I talk to most godly men, and e I think even the unbelieving world will say to me, if you ask them, would you die for your wife? Like if there was a, you know, you know, if there was a gun pointed at your head, it's you or your wife, would you take the bullet? I think most men would say, yeah, you know, I would take it, right? I, I would do that. So, you know, some people might say, yeah, you know, I I'm willing to die for my wife. You know why? Because it's kind of like if you die, it's the end. <laughs> like, like it, it, it's finished and it's this brief moment. Right? It's this moment of, of being a hero and, and showing your wife how much you love her. You know, if you're able to, no, I don't think that's ever going to happen. Like, it, it's, it's probably a rare occasion where you have to willingly give up your life for your wife. Okay? But in some ways, you kind of do your whole life, right? In some ways, you know, when you take on a wife, you are making a commitment for the rest of your life to look after that woman. Okay? You're no longer a single man. You're no longer just worried about your own things. But you're going to uh, spend, what you, and we're going to cover this, you should be spending equal time with your wife as much as you would toward yourself. We'll look at that later on. Okay? But you need to be able to give yourself to this relationship. Give yourself to this wife. I think most people are willing to die for their wife. I, I certainly am. I'm willing to die for my own children if I had to. Okay? I'm willing to die. Especially as a Christian. Especially as a believer. Because you know where you're going. right? You know where you're going. And it's better to be with the Lord anyway. And it's such a great thing if you had to give up your life for your family. I think it would be a, an honorable thing. A great thing. Okay? That's point number one. We won't spend too much time on that. I think that's pretty crystal clear. It's, it's a no-brainer. Most decent husbands would die for their wives. Point number two, guys, is to love her by providing safety and security. Wives need safety and security. Okay? This is why they have a desire for a husband. This is why they're looking for a man that will take ownership over them instead of their father. Because their father, as we've already known, will look after them, will raise them, right? will give them security, will protect them. Wives are looking for the same thing from their husband. Look at verse 23, Ephesians 5.23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the, look at this, and he is the saviour of the body. The Saviour. We know Jesus Christ is our Lord. We know He's our Saviour, right? He saved us from our sins. He saved us from eternity in hell. Now, you may not have to save your wife in that sense. You may never have an opportunity that you save her life, okay? But when you're saved, what does that bring with it? When you're saved, it brings safety, doesn't it? It means you're safe. It means you're secure, okay? You're safe and secure, so you need to love her by providing safety and security, okay? And this is why I said to you guys, it's so important that if, you need, if you're looking for a wife, the first thing you need is to get a job. You need to be able to provide for your family. You need to provide for your wife so she has what she needs to feel secure, to feel safe by your hands, okay? If you bypass the work, you're going to have a hard time finding a wife because they're going to see that lack, that, that missing ingredient there. You know, and, and they're going to be drawn more to the men that can provide for them, that can give them security. Okay? It's important. It's important to be working a job and being a provider. Your wife is looking for security from her husband. Stability. You know, you need to be that rock, you need to be that foundation. Jesus Christ, right? He's the, he's the foundation of the church, He's the head of the church. As husbands, we need to be that strong foundation for our wives. Okay, we need to be a uh, stable minded, right? If you're coming up with some idea tomorrow and then you change your mind the next day and it's like, oh, we're going to do this, oh, no, we're going to do that, oh, no, we're going to move overseas, no, we're actually going to do this, you give, it's going to make it very difficult. Right? That's not loving your wife. Uh, it's, e it's easy for men for us to just go and do that project and do this. You know, we have this sort of tunnel vision approach, you know, but. You know, wives are thinking of the children. They're thinking of themselves. Hey, how are we going to provide? What, what, what's the future going to hold? Hey, we need to be able to provide that. We need to give them that safe, secure. Hey, when Jesus Christ saves us, he gives us uh, eternal security. 
right? We don't have to doubt that maybe tomorrow we're not saved. It's the same thing. Your wife is looking for that security from you as a man. That's another way of showing love toward your wife. If you don't give them safety and security, it's a lack of love. You know, when I first, when we, the house we currently uh, are renting that we lived in before we came up here, when we purchased that house, um, it, you know, it was the best that we could get, but the front, there was this, it sort of, there was this one front door, and then on the sides there were these sort of uh, glazed windows. But it wasn't that great. I mean, it wasn't that glazed. Like, you could, you could walk up to it and see through straight into the living room, right? You could see the family if they were in the living room or doing whatever, you know? And my wife felt not safe, right? Because Sydney is not the safest place to live. You know, especially Western Sydney, there's a lot of crime, there's a lot of break-ins and a lot of that stuff. And so, hey, it was my responsibility to do something about that, right? I mean, so we just got some double doors. We, we got a carpenter to come in, put in double doors. We put a security gate as well there. Um, and then you couldn't see through the house, right? But hey, that's my responsibility. I ought to be giving her security and safety. Especially when I have little children around the house, the amount of perverts and reprobates that are out there, you know, pedophiles that try, you know, come in and try to take your children. You know, you've got to provide safety to your wife. That's, that's a way of showing love, okay? And if they're, if they're insecure, if, if they're not feeling safe, if they're not feeling grounded, then you're not demonstrating love toward your wife, okay? Now, obviously, I, I just want to point this out. I'm not saying that you know, we don't trust in the Lord for our safety, okay? Of course. You know, I'm not trying to say to you that, you know, there's, there's not a time. I mean, it, this is always a time. There's always time to have faith in the Lord that He will protect us, okay? But you've got to understand, God has put you in that family. God has given you that wife in many ways to be that security, okay? I mean, if you can't defend yourself, maybe learn how to fight a little bit. Learn how to punch a little bit. Right? Learn to be a little bit manly so if anybody ever comes and attacks your family, you're ready for it. Okay? I mean, God has made man to be the stronger vessel. Okay? Uh, it's easier for a man to have a fight. It's easier for a man to push someone else away uh, in case of danger. We just got to keep this in mind. We need to be able to love her. Yes, that means putting yourself in danger for protection of your family. As we saw even to the point of death. If, if that's what it requires, okay? So, uh, you know, your, your wife feels loved when they're grounded and stable, when there's clear vision and clear goals for the family. You know, don't change your minds, like, from one day to the next. They're going to feel unsettled, unsure of what's going on. Uh, point number three. Love her by being the spiritual leader. Love her by being the spiritual leader. Ephesians 5.26. Look at verse 26. <clears throat> this is talking about Jesus Christ and the church, that he might sanctify. What does it mean to sanctify? To cleanse, right? Um, to sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Okay, so when we wash with water, we're cleansing. If you've had a shower today, you were doing it to keep clean, right? To, to get the dirt off you. And this is what Jesus Christ does for the church. He waters it, he cleanses it, he sanctifies the church by the water of his word. Okay? And again, the comparison of husband and wife. What does that mean to you as the head of your wife? It means you need to make efforts to sanctify your wife, to cleanse her with the waters of God's word. You are meant to take a spiritual leadership position in your home. Okay? Um, you need to teach your wife the Word of God. Now, it's, it's a good thing if you're, if you're recently married and you have no children. Now, you know, your focus is on your wife. You ought to open the Bible together. You ought to read the Bible together and talk about what it says. And teach what you can. You say, well, I'm a new Christian. I don't know. Well, just teach what you can. Right? You know, if you're saved, the Holy Ghost will teach you all these things. That also means bring her to church. Right? Bring your wife to church. Like, if, if you can't do it, then bring them to church. You should be bringing them to church anyway. So they can learn and grow. 
Okay? And then God adds to the family slowly. He'll add one child, then the other child, and the other child. But hopefully you've done enough groundwork with your wife that now she's ready to be a good godly mother, spiritual mother, to her children as well. You've got to take ownership of this. Okay? You're the spiritual head of your wife. You know, is Jesus not always there for us? Is God not always there for us to guide us in our spiritual walk? We don't know what the Bible says. We can always ask him for questions, can't we? You know, uh, we, we might be lacking a bit of direction in our life. We can pray to the Lord, ask, Lord, please, please guide me to know the truth. Please guide me in your word to find this answer. Hey, that's what we ought to be like toward our wives. You know, willing to answer the questions that might come you know, her, her way, and, and teach her. This is the training ground. This is why the qualifications of a bishop is to have that, you know, husband of the one wife and the faithful children is because a lot of the teaching should have already been done in the family, right? And the stuff that you taught your wife and kids, and I do this a lot. A lot of the things I taught my wife and kids, I'm teaching you guys, right? I've already spent the time studying it. I've already spent the time teaching it, right? That's where the practice comes from, not from Bible college, from training and teaching your wife and children. You are responsible for your wife's spiritual development. Look at verse 27. So why does he wash, why does Jesus wash um, the church by the water of the word? Verse 27, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now, if we just took those words kind of like, not having spot. Like if I'm talking to a woman here and I said to you, hey, you, you know, you shouldn't have a spot or wrinkle or, or no, no blemishes. She's going to think cosmetics. Like she's going to think makeup, right? <laughs> to, to fix up her appearance. It's kind of that same idea, right? It's kind of that same idea. You know, we start with our, our defects and our weaknesses, but the word of God should make us more pure. Right? It should help us overcome sins and, and the weaknesses that we have in our lives. Okay? I'm not talking about the outward appearance here. Right? We're talking about the spiritual growth of your wife. Because we ought to want our wife to be presented to us without blemish, and bl and blame, uh, without, blemish without spot or wrinkle. Hey, that's our work, guys. I don't know if you, if you know this or not, but husbands, if your wife is lacking in spiritual areas of her life, you need to work on that. You know, you, you need to make it a practice to take the word of God and guide your wife and show her what the Bible says about these certain things. And this, you know why we don't do it? Because more often than not, our wives will get offended by us. <laughs> no, they'll get offended. But look, if you're a wife, let me just say, don't get offended. If your husband does that, if they bring the Bible to you and try to help you develop and grow, it's not because they're being critical well, in a way they are, but it's the doing it because they love you. Okay, this is what we're learning, how Christ loves the church. None of us doubt Christ's love for the church. So if we do the same thing as husbands, it's because we love you. We're trying to do, uh, you know, emulate how Jesus Christ loves the church. We're trying to emulate that in our lives with our, with our wives. Okay, so please, you know, wives, whoever's listening to this, if your husband comes with the word of God, don't get offended. It's a gesture of love. It's love, okay? They're lovingly guiding you using the Word of God. And use the Word of God, by the way. Use the Word of God. Otherwise, yeah, it's going to come across as you just being overly critical and, and whatever. Hey, but it's our, our job to, to nourish our wife, to look after her spiritually as well. Not just physically, but spiritually. You know, and... Uh, <clears throat> You, you know, you might say, well, you know, my wife is not as spiritual as me. You know, I'm, I'm getting into these deep and, 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 you know, heavy doctrines. My wife's still, a, you know, a baby in Christ. Hey, it's your responsibility to get her at your level. Yep. All right? It's your responsibility to take her, teach her, and not complain that she's not up to that level. Okay? That's your responsibility. Right? I mean, a, a, a teacher doesn't blame the kids if they're, they're struggling. No, it's, the teacher's there to guide them, to train them, to teach them. Same thing. It's your responsibility as a husband to teach your wife. And, uh, you know, you might say another, another excuse. And look, I've probably used this excuse before. 
all right, is, well, if only the pastor preached more on X, Y, Z, whatever it is, right? My, my, my husband or my wife needs to hear more about this topic. Why doesn't the pastor preach more on that? Well, maybe there's some truth to that, right? If, if your pastor's not doing a you know, well-rounded doctrines, not trying to teach the whole Bible and they're just focused on, you know, on, on milk of the Word of God, yeah, maybe that's a, that's a complaint that you could have. But again, if your pastor's not doing it, who's the head of the family? Who should be doing it? The husband, okay? If, if the pastor's lacking in an area, husband, you pick it up and you train your family, you train your wife, Okay? Don't use the excuses that I, even I've used in the past, okay? Um, now, one question that comes my way a bit is, because, uh, you know, there's, no perf- there's not always this perfect scenario where the husband necessarily knows more of the Bible than the wife. In many cases, the wife has been saved longer than the husband. In many cases, the wife knows more about the Bible. She's more spiritual. She's walking the Lord more than the husband. And uh, one question that's come my way quite a bit is, you know, what if, what if my wife knows more than me, right? You know, how, how can my husband be the spiritual leader if, you know, he doesn't know as much as I do or he's just a new Christian, he doesn't really know that much? It doesn't matter. Even if you don't know that much, you're still the leader. You're still the head of your home, okay? Now, I'll tell you what makes good leadership, what makes you a good leader is learning how to delegate. <laughs> I mean, a classic example, right? I, I couldn't go to Sydney this week. So what did I do? I delegated that responsibility onto Jason. Jason went out. Does that make me any less of a leader? Of course not, okay? And good leaders will see qualities in their, um, you know, in their people and use those strengths that the others have, right? A good leader doesn't always... Uh, no more than the others. A good leader doesn't always, isn't always stronger on some areas than others. I used to think that. I used to think what it took to be a good leader was to be better than everybody else. No. What makes a good leader is to be able to identify the strengths that other people have and use them for those strengths. Okay? And uh, look, if your wife knows more than you on the Bible, then use her strength. Right? But you still be the leader. You still say, honey, after dinner tonight at 7 p.m., the family's going to get together, we're going to open the Word of God, we're going to sing a hymn, and after I read that chapter, if I'm struggling with it, then feel free to, you know, you know share your thoughts on that chapter. You know, I recognize you've been saved longer, I recognize you know the Bible more, but I'm still going to lead this time of, of spiritual learning. Okay? That's fine. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with delegating. Nothing wrong with using your wife's strengths if she has, you know. But you only fail as a spiritual leader when you don't do that. When you don't make a time and decide, hey, as a family, let's open the Word of God and, and, and read and, and sing hymns. Let's praise the Lord at home. And by the way, just as a side thing, if your kids struggle in church, te- teach them at home. Teach them to sit still at home, sing hymns at home, teach them to be quiet at home, and then when they get to church, it's normal. They're doing that every week at home, you know, and then the expectation is at church, they'll be the same, you know. But anyway, that's just a side note. Um, let's look at, uh, uh, let's have a look. Oh yeah, just one more thing, by the way, just, just one little word of caution. Um, so... If you are the leader of your home and you should be as a husband and you delegate some of that responsibility to your wife to teach the family, that's fine. But again, be careful because 1 Timothy 2.14 says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Okay, so one thing you need to understand, and I, I think this is just a general... I mean, think about, think about when you go soul winning. Think about when you go door to door soul winning. Of course, we see both men and ladies get saved, but wouldn't you say it's more often the ladies that get saved? Wouldn't you say it's more often the ladies that are willing to have that spiritual talk? You know? So, I mean, that's good. That's a good thing. But again, if they're more willing to have that spiritual talk with you, then what about when the Jehovah Witnesses knocks on their door? What about when the Mormon knocks on their door? Don't you think they're going to be more willing to have that spiritual talk with them as well? Of course. And why do you think Satan went after Eve? Do you think 
Adam would have put up with a serpent telling him what the Word of God says? No way, right? Adam, I don't know, if he, maybe he couldn't die back. I, don't know, I was going to say Adam would have stepped on that, you know, that snake and you know, uh, got a shovel and, and no, nah, but probably not, right? But, um, you know, Satan would just, would just been like, you know, snake, shut up. You know, God told me himself, you know, don't, you know, you know, you're just bringing deception or whatever. But Eve, she spent time. She decided to listen to what the serpent had to say and she was deceived. So just be mindful of that. Just be mindful. Yes, it's fine to let your, your, your wife take some, um, uh, to teach in the family, Okay, we're not talking about the church, we're talking about in the family, but you're the leader, you're delegating that responsibility, that's fine, but also be aware that she is also easier to be deceived than you in the scriptures. It's just a spiritual truth, okay? Um, all right, so point number four, guys. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 28. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 28. Love her as much as you love yourself. Love her as much as you love yourself. Ephesians 5.28 uh, So what men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. So, I used to struggle with this verse, actually. Um... Uh, verse 28, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. I used to struggle with this because, uh, you know, I feel like I don't really take care of my body all that much. <laughs> like, you know, when I had work, you know, I'd get up, you know, maybe have a shower, put a little gel in my hair, it's probably the most I would do to look, 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 you know, uh, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Respectable, Respectable whatever. And, and I'd, I'd go to, work like I wouldn't really care that much about myself you know I don't I don't really look after I probably should be looking after what I eat a bit more than what I, what I do right and I used to be like I don't really look after myself all that much you know surely I've got to love my wife more than I than I look after myself but it started to come clearer to me later on but let's have a look at this in verse 29 it says for no man ever yet hateth his own flesh but nourisheth it and cherisheth it so when it's all about nourishing your flesh, obviously when you're hungry, I mean, every man does this, right? When you're hungry, you go looking for food. You eat, okay? You look after your body and you cherish it, right? If you're cold, you put on... Cameron, you're, you're rubbing your stomach there. <laughs> but when you're cold, you put on a jacket, you put on something warm, right? You look after yourself, you look after your body. It's more than just how you appear, but you really do. If you have a need, if you've hurt yourself, you go and try to heal that wound, right? You don't just let that wound open and fester with infections and whatever. You look after your body. And God is saying, hey, as much as you look after your own body, that's how you ought to look after your wife. Now, let me give you some ideas of this, okay? Because don't think about just the physical body, but think about, expand your thoughts a little bit on this, okay? Because men are actually able to look after themselves a lot more than you think, Okay? As men, we're good at uh, fulfilling our passions and desires, our hobbies, right? Again, that tunnel vision. We have something in mind and we're good at doing it, okay? I mean, we can literally spend thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars on some old car, you know, if you're into cars, you know, and fixing it up, you know. I've seen men do this. You know, it's some old beat-up car, but it's their hobby, it's their love, and when I've asked them, how much have you spent on that? Oh, $20,000. Like, what? You know, the car's not even worth that much. <laughs> right? But it's a hobby. They spend thousands because why? It's, it's entertaining for them, right? It's something they're passionate about. They seek to go about and, and, and accomplish this project. You know? Um, I went, so Callum's not here, but I went soloing with Callum. Um, and uh, there was this man that led us into his house. And he showed us his um, train his, uh, what was it? It was, a, it was a tr like a model train set. He had like a whole train thing. And, um, you know, it was pretty nice. You know, I've seen nicer ones. And he said to us, oh, I've spent about $100,000 on this. I'm like, what? $100,000 on toys. On toys, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, we can, it's hard enough to save up that money just to have a deposit for a house or something. And he's spending it on toy trains. You know, in fact, before we, we came up here, I took the, the kid, I don't know if you remember this kids, I took him to like a train, um, 
like a train show. There's all these toy trains as well. And I was thinking when we get there, maybe I'll buy them a train set. Maybe I'll buy them... I, it was like $5,000 for a train. <laughs> it's like, what in the world? <laughs> you know, th there's no way we're going to enter into that hobby. Like, we can't afford it. We can't even afford a train. You know, but, you know, we spend a lot of time. We spend a lot of money. You know, not just money, but hours upon hours upon hours on our projects. That really don't mean anything f for eternity. <laughs> All right? Um, <coughs> you know, um, you know uh, people spend hours and hours watching sports. You know, men are good at that. Hours and hours and hours every week watching their favorite team playing sports. It's just a waste of time. But they're doing it. They're doing it for their own body. They're doing it for their own pleasure. They're doing it for their own entertainment. You know, going to the gym, watching sports, all these kind of things. And you know what? I, I think it's natural for a man who's worked, you know, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 hours in his day to like get home and be like, oh man, I just need to blow a bit of steam off a bit. You know, I've just been at work all day. I can understand that because I've been there, right? And you come home, especially if you've got a home full of children. It's like, oh, no. <laughs> Maybe it's a little bit easier even at work <laughs> than coming home and dealing with the kids, you know? And I, I can understand it, right? But here's where the disconnect happens, you know? And, and I'm sharing this because it's happened to me. You know, it's, I'm not saying like, where, you know, you know you've worked, you know, let's say 12 hours. You come home, you're tired. You kind of don't want to talk. You just want to just relax. But... Your wife has spent those 12 hours without you, looking after the family, raising the kids, looking. And they want adult stimulation. They want to talk to you because they spent all day talking to little children. They want to interact with an adult, but then the husband comes home and is like, I don't want to talk. You know, I've just spent this many hours at work. And okay, it can happen from time to time, but then you have one day go past, you haven't talked, you got another day go past, becomes weeks, becomes months, and all of a sudden it's like you don't even know each other. Right? It's a dangerous thing. What I'm trying to say here, guys, I'm not against blowing off a bit of steam. I'm not against having your hobbies and having a bit of passion and all those kind of, I think it's healthy for you. I think it's healthy for your mind to do these kind of things. But love your wives as your own bodies. Now, this is what I'm trying to say to you. If, if let's say, the way you blow off a bit of steam and spend a bit of time is you go on YouTube and, you know, sit watch a bit of videos and you're there for an hour just watching the latest videos or whatever, you spend an hour for yourself, right? Then what I'm trying to say to you is, you need, now need to give your wife an hour of your time. Okay? Your wife deserves that hour as well. Okay? Because if you're able to love yourself enough to give yourself an hour of computer time or whatever, and you're meant to love your wife as you love yourself, your own bodies, then you need to give your wife an hour of your time. Okay? This is the balance. This is the balance, guys. Whatever you do for yourself, you say, honey, I just need to get out of the house a little bit get away from the kids, get away from the family, that's fine. But understand, you need to afford your wife that same opportunity for her to get out once in a while. Honey, I'll look after the kids today. You've had a hard day. I'll, I'll watch them. You go out with your friends, whatever. You guys have, you know, have a good time. Even better than that, hey, honey, how about we go on a date? If you've got someone that can look after your kids, instead of you having to spend your own hour and then making it up with your wife, just do it together, right? Take her out on a date. You know, make it special. If you, ideally, if you've got someone that can look after the kids. You go, I've got no one to look after the kids. All right, bring the kids along. <laughs> right? You're a family. This is what you want. So this is what God wants for you, right? It's for you to spend time with your family. You know, don't become you know, a father that's completely disconnected from his wife and kids. It's just going to cause you problems for the rest of your life. Okay? It, it's, it's going to cause your wife to think, I didn't even know this man. I, I knew him when I married him, but I don't know him today. And look, we all change. We all grow. We all develop. That's part of life. But if you're not spending that time with your wife, she's going to get to the point where she doesn't even know who you are anymore because you haven't had that communication. She hasn't, you know, you haven't spent time with her. So please, this is what I, this is, this is what I truly believe it means. If we love ourselves enough to go after our passions, to go watch a soccer game, this is me, right, for two hours, then I ought to be like, hey, I need to give Christina two hours of my time. You know, I've, I've done this for myself. She needs my attention. I should go out there and entertain her, right, <laughs> whatever it takes, and spend time with my wife. Uh, this is very important. This is showing that you love her. Because if you don't do that, you're just showing that you love yourself and you're not loving her as much as you love yourself, okay? I actually think this point, point number four, is probably the hardest point for us as men. I think this is the hardest one for us to do, okay? 
Um, and I'll just quickly read to you Colossians 3.19. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Be not bitter against them. Right? Don't, don't say harsh words to them. Or, you know, sometimes you might say words, but between the lines, you know, you had to dig at them, you know. Don't be bitter. And look, again, I've had hard days at work, frustrated, under pressure. And I've come home, and unfortunately, I've brought that pressure, you know, to my wife or to my kids. You know, I should be angry at my work situation, but I'm bringing that to my family. It's wrong. It shouldn't be, shouldn't be that way, okay? You know, we shouldn't be bitter toward our wives. Hey, they work hard. Raising a family is hard work. Looking after the house is hard work. Okay, preparing a meal takes time. Okay, sometimes they don't have all the ingredients. They need to go out and get all that stuff. And now they don't have time to do some of the other tasks around the house. Look, they're working. They're working just as hard. You need to afford them time. Communicate with them. Love them as much as you love your own bodies. Don't be bitter against them. And the fifth point that I have is love her by keeping her involved. Love her by keeping her involved. Look at verse 31, Ephesians 5, 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife. For they too shall be one flesh. So important. You're a team. You're together. It's not about, look, your married life shouldn't be, I do my thing, she does her thing. That, that is not being one flesh. That's not being one team. Look at verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. You know, so God created your wife to be your help. We know that, right? Genesis 3, a help meet for Adam, Eve was. Um, you are a team. You're meant to do things together. Okay? How, I mean, if you're doing things separately, how is she helping you? Okay? And you know this. A team can accomplish more than one singular person can do. Okay? So if you want to reach your goals, you, want, you have this, these goals in your life, whatever they are, you're going to be more successful at it if you have your wife by your side achieving those things. And she's going to feel loved being by your side knowing what your goals are, being involved in your life, you know, being able to help you with those goals. You know, um, you know, a team can achieve more than the individual. And men, sometimes we can lack communication with our wife. We can lack telling them what our goals are, what, what our plans are. And um, it, even to, I got to a point in my life where I, I quit my job because I had been working pretty much nine years, um, long hours, and I realized, wow, where I started nine years ago with hmm, no kids, nine years later with, I don't know how many we had then, six kids, life had changed, right, for us, but we, I hadn't sat down with my wife, we haven't got together and said, hey, what is the next chapter for our life? What are we working toward now? Yes, nine years ago, we got to where we are now, but where are we going moving forward? You need to keep your wife in communication so she can help you she's there to help you you know I, i've had stories of i i, I know this fab this couple right? they're friends of mine but anyway i don't think they're listening online so. <laughs> but uh, you know he um he bought a house in the northern territory and then he's like his wife didn't know right and then he's like all right honey we're selling up we're moving to the northern territory she's like what in the world like no idea at all about these plans we talked about the stability and the security, not knowing, lack of communication. Oh, but I'm the man of the house, you know. It's my, it is his decision. But it's also his command to love his wife, keep her involved, make sure he communicates, show love to her. This is not love, right? Just changing things like that, moving to another state, uh, to a, quite a barren state, and, uh, and changing things up like that without even having talked to his wife. This is wrong. It's a team. You're one flesh. Don't be doing your own thing without letting your wife... I'm not saying get your wife's permission, but at least inform her as to what's going on. Okay? Be that team. And, uh, you know, listen to her needs. Listen to her needs and her cries for help. Women are not like men. Have you learned that yet? I don't know if you learned... I, I'm still learning that. I'm still learning that, right? Because if, if a man needs help... 
You know, some, let's say Matthew needs help. You'll be like, Kevin, I need some help. I've got this situation. What should I do? No, wives are not like that. <laughs> okay? <laughs> They'll say something, and it's like, is she being critical of me? But it's a cry of help. <laughs> we haven't, you know, and, and maybe, maybe we take offense to it. It's like, why is she saying that? You know, is she, is she saying I'm a bad husband? Hey, maybe she's saying, I need a help in this area. You know, can you please lead me? Can you please guide me? Can you please provide some sort of guidance, right? And <laughs> we're a team, okay? And I'm sure, husband, I'm sure we all experience this, right? Wives communicate differently to the way we would like it, okay? We've got to sometimes just read between the lines and, you know, you know uh, honey, are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. No, she's not okay. Okay, there's, there's something behind that and you need to work that out, okay? Um, anyway, it, it, you're a team. Keep her involved. Keep communicating with your wife. Uh, women need to communicate a lot more than men. You need to get that information out of them compared, because just, you know, your, your friend, your best friend is just going to tell you, you know, the situation. Wives, you kind of have to dig that out of them a bit more. Um, uh, let me just quickly read to you guys from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. 1 Peter 3, 7, it says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife. Hey, give honor unto your wife. Honor your wife. Lift her up. If she's a godly woman, if she's served you today, if she's looked after the children, if she's homeschooled the children, give her honor, encourage her, praise her, love her. That's how you give her honor. You love her. Show her your appreciation. As unto the weaker vessel. She's weaker than you, guys. Physically, she's weaker than you. Spiritually, she can be deceived. She's weaker in that sense as well. You've got to look after her. Nurture her. Love her. Honor her. And then it says this. As being heirs together of the grace of life. You and your wife are heirs together. Okay? The um, institution of your family is a work you do together. It's not like, honey, you look after the family, I'll go do my thing. No. You're heirs together, you're a team, you're one flesh. She needs you and, and uh, you need her to work together to be able to accomplish more in your life. And then it says this, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. You know, if you're a husband and you're like, it seems like God's not answering my prayers. For some reason, it seems like my prayers are being, hind uh, are being um, hindered. It seems like I'm going backwards in my life. Why, why aren't I achieving? Why aren't I moving forward in my life? I would just say to you, how's your marriage? <laughs> All right? How's your marriage? Maybe the Lord is hindering his prayers to you because you're not looking after your wife. You're not loving her. You're not honoring her the way you ought to. You're not giving of yourself. You're not loving her the way you love your own body as much as uh, Christ loved the church. These are, this is an important thing. You know, our, this is important. We can't expect us to have these spiritual victories in our life when our marriage is falling apart, when our wives have lost respect for us, when our wives don't know that we love them. Okay? You want to be a successful Christian, a spiritual man, see souls saved, do great things for God, you need to have a good marriage. You need to love your wife. That, that's what you need to be doing. Okay? Simple things. The, the simple things God has given man to do, we need to achieve that. We need to love our wives. And so, you know, are you loving your wife? I'll just leave you with that question. Are you loving your wife? You say, yes, of course I'm loving you. Are you loving her as much as Christ loves the church? That's the question. You know, so in conclusion... I'll just give you those five points again. Love her with a sacrificial love. Love her by providing safety and security. Love her by being the spiritual leader. Love her as much as you love yourself. And love her by keeping her involved. You're a team. Okay, let's pray.